first met Alan uh, at a NICVA, uh, a recent NICVA event, uh, when they launched their report uh, looking at the devolution or the potential devolution of, of further fiscal powers. And I found his work and his presentation absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure all of you will, will find the same today as well. The, uh, the Committee for Finance and Personnel has followed the debates on devolution finance in Scotland uh, and in Wales with considerable in interest. Uh, and as Alan will discuss, uh, there has not been the same kind of wide-ranging uh, public debate here in the North as there has been in Scotland and Wales and is now actually beginning uh, in the City of London as well. Uh, so, as we all know from the, the, the recent debates within uh, these islands, there is a change in dynamic, uh, there is a changing debate. Uh, the Scottish independence referendum is next year. There is discussions about Devo Max and Devo Plus. Uh, and this is an area uh, throughout all of these islands that, uh, that, that people uh, and policymakers are, are looking at uh, more keenly uh, and trying to see what the pros and cons are uh, of uh, different policies uh, in each of those areas. So it is important uh, that we do invest some time in looking at these areas uh, as, as we move forward. Some time ago, uh, the committee held an evidence session with Alan uh, Gerald uh, Holdham and Ian McLean. Uh, and following that session, the committee resolved to hold an inquiry into the Barnet formula uh, and the way that it operates in the North. This afternoon, Alan will touch on some issues around Barnet, uh, and we in the committee shall be paying close attention to those points. Last week, the committee received a briefing on the June 2012 report uh, issued by NICFA's Centre for Economic Empowerment which sought to highlight uh, the report's findings following a review of the Assembly's fiscal powers. During the briefing, uh, members of the Finance Committee engaged with the report's authors about some key issues uh, that do uh, lay ahead uh, for us. Today's knowledge, seminar, knowledge Exchange Seminar is an opportunity to explore those issues further uh, with the benefit of Professor <coughs> Trench's insights based on his research findings. And one important point uh, that I do see uh, in Alan's policy briefing, which you'll find in your pack, uh, is that Barnet and devolved financing uh, generally rests not in statute, uh, but on a Treasury policy statement. Uh, and I hope Alan will speak about the impact of this policy on the executive. Uh, and I expect this is something that the committee uh, will consider uh, further in future. I also note uh, the points Alan makes in his policy briefing about the lack of transparency uh, surrounding Barnet. Uh, the committee has been pushing for greater transparency for some time uh, with very limited success. Uh, and we now regularly uh, require figures from the Department of Finance and Personnel uh, following Westminster government uh, spending announcements. Uh, these help to show how Barnet consequentials have been generated. Uh, and these, in, in these subtle ways, the committee is beginning uh, to erode the frustrating uh, lack of transparency that does exist. Uh, and in the coming period, the committee will start to see uh, what further progress uh, can be made. So just before I uh, round off, uh, can I say again that it is a pleasure uh, to open the event here today. We do not have enough debate uh, about this area of governance. Uh, and I personally find it very frustrating uh, that in terms of the body politic here, uh, that in terms of economics, in terms of fiscal powers uh, and the control of fiscal powers and, and the waiving of those uh, policy-making uh, powers, uh, that there, there's an absence, there's a gap, uh, and using those uh, fiscal powers, having those debates, uh, and ultimately, in my personal opinion, having those powers will actually help to change the body politic here in the North, uh, and hopefully that is something that can be, be to all uh, of our benefit. Alan and, and people that work in this field are key uh, to building a knowledge base from which we as legislators, uh, as policy makers within the departments, can make decisions uh, in regard to fiscal policy uh, and the economy. And I look forward uh, to his presentation here today. So without further ado, uh, can I introduce Professor Alan Trench. Thank you very much, Ditty. And thank you very much uh, to the Assembly uh, uh, for inviting me to get, come and give this talk in the context of the KESS series, and to you, you for, um, for engaging with me and helping facilitate such, um, such discussions. Um, I've been working on devolution finance for um, about, oh gosh, about eight, nine years now. 
um, I decided, in the context of doing work on intergovernmental relations generally, that finance was going to be the next big thing. And what a good job I did, what a good job I, uh, I made that choice, because it certainly has. Um, it's one of those debates, one of those areas that gets very technical, um, or can very easily get very technical. Um, you'll be pleased to know I have hardly any figures in today's uh, discussion, and I have um, no equations whatever, nor do I have any charts. I'm trying to speak today about the principles and the, out and, and the effects of the system that we have in place at the moment and what we might do about it. So I'm not going to try and, and, and deluge you with complicated statistics or economics in this discussion. Um, it's focused on political and administrative questions. Now, these finance debates essentially kicked off in 2007. Um, although there'd been a bit of discussion before then, it was very largely um, academic and it was pretty much in the background. It was far from the forefront of any discussion. I would attribute that in large part to um, the effect of, of Labour's dominance of government um, across the UK, across, across Great Britain, sorry, and particularly in Scotland, because the present arrangements, the Barnet formula system, um, particularly advantages Scotland. Um, and now we know somewhat disadvantages Wales. Um, the effect of this is that, that Scottish Labour has been terribly keen to stop any change happening, and the best way to stop any change happening has been to stop anybody talking about it. So the absence of discussion before 2007 was a function of that, the fact that Labour was dominating coalition government in Scotland in, um, in government at, at Westminster. We're now at the point where it's very clear there are some quite serious problems in this system, and one, one, one scholar, whom Dettie Mackay has already mentioned, um, Ian McLean, describes it as, as being a, cri a system in crisis, a, a formula that is broke. I'm not sure I would go as far as that, but it's certainly become a very problematic situation. Um, and those problems are becoming more and more clear, partly because they are also sounding in England. England, of course, is about 85% of the economy of the UK as a whole, a little bit less of population. Um, the English are now, we know quite clearly from the Future of England surveys that um, Guy Lodge at IPPR, Charlie Jeffrey at Edinburgh University, Richard Wynne-Jones at Cardiff have coordinated, are getting bothered about this. They are getting bothered about the lopsided nature of the Constitution, the fact that England has no special voice, whereas Scotland, <coughs> Wales and Northern Ireland all do, and that they are, effect they are both disenfranchised by this through the West Lothian formula, and they feel there's, a, there's something wrong about that, and they're concerned about the extent to which they're subsidising other parts of the UK. And again, it is Scotland that is first and foremost um, in the firing line there, and rightly so. Um, what we have seen since 2007, which I will survey, are some quite complex debates in Scotland and Wales. And I will try and chart the courses of those debates first before I start to talk more directly about the shortcomings of the Barnett formula. Um, because those debates also need to be understood. They are going to have an effect on the choices that are open for Northern Ireland. Now, in Scotland, we have seen two key ideas emerge to orient the debates. One is what is known as fiscal autonomy. Um, and the other is what has become known as financial or fiscal accountability. Um, sometimes there is reference to a third concept of fiscal responsibility. So you could be autonomous, responsible, or accountable, but not, it seems, all three at once. Um, autonomy is an, uh, is an idea that's primarily associated with the SNP side of the wider constitutional debates. Um, it's something that, I, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, Accountability is the idea that has dominated the unionist side, the pro-union side of these debates so far. It was written into the terms of reference for the Kalman Commission, the Commission on Scottish Devolution, um, which was established in early 2008 and reported in 2009 under the chairmanship of Sir Kenneth Kalman, and whose recommendations are largely enacted in the Scotland Act 2012. Now, the key to these recommendations is the partial devolution of income tax, the devolution of what is called 10 points of income tax. The mechanism for this will be that there will be a reduction in the UK rate of income tax in Scotland 
by 10 points over each band. So the standard rate will drop from 20% to 10%, the higher rate from 40% to 30%, the top rate from 45% to 35%. And that vacates tax space. There will also be a cut in the block grant, a so-called proportionate cut in the block grant. And that will mean that it will be open to the Scottish Parliament to leave the tax rates at their new level, if it wishes, but impose a swindling cut in public services as well, because it will simply not have the money to pay for a large chunk of the public services that it has at the moment. Or it can set a rate of its own. And the accountability comes because it is going to be compelled to set, an, set a rate. The politicians will be forced to make a choice about what that Scottish rate of income tax will be. Um, and they will then be held accountable for that. Going with the devolved income tax power is devolution of some small taxes, stamp duty land tax and landfill tax. Not air passenger duty, though that's being devolved here uh, for long haul flights. Um, and though it was recommended by Calman, not the aggregate levy, another very small land-related tax um, that was also recommended by, Calman, uh, by, by the Calman Commission. There's also, there's beyond that, a power to introduce new taxes. There are some criteria that are laid out in the command paper that accompanied the, Scotland, the bill for the Scotland Act um, that set out those. And it, it would be quite hard for those criteria as they stand to be satisfied by a tax that wasn't a land tax. It might be possible, um, but they, would they will mostly be land taxes or quite limited taxes like possibly bag charges, though that can be done as a charge, not a tax. There's probably the power there to do it already. Um, and there will be this proportionate cut in the block grant, and there's been a lot of fuss about how that cut is going to be made. And indeed, a lot of the detail of that is not clear. Um, Implementation of Calman is well underway. The bill reached the statute book uh, last year. SDL, stamp duty land tax, landfill tax will be devolved from 2015. The bill for the replacement for stamp duty land tax, which is going to be called a land and buildings transaction tax, um, is already before the Scottish Parliament. A collection agency is already being established to collect those two taxes. Income tax is due to start in 2016. Uh, originally, the idea was that it would be devolved in 2060, with effect from 2016, uh, so that uh, proposals for the use of the new power would be in manifestos for the 2015 Scottish Parliament elections. Then they moved the timing of the elections. They haven't moved the implementation date for the start of the tax powers. It is conceivable they might get shifted as a result. Um, far from certain, and all that would in any event assume a no vote. One of the little ironies is that, um, that, that the Calman proposals would not come in until, the, until after the proposed date for Scottish independence that the SNP has suggested, assuming a yes vote in the 2014 referendum. It's, even a small change takes a long time. Um, one of the problems with those first few years is going to be that they will run on estimates of the Scottish tax revenue. And there was a difference between the, the Labour government's and the coalition government's proposals for implementing Calman. Labour proposed just using estimates of Scottish revenues um, throughout. Uh, the coalition said, no, we'll use the estimates for a transition period only. And as soon as we can, we will move to using actual hard numbers. Now, that seems to me very important because it's key to ensuring that, um, that what happens actually is meaningful responsibility. If this system of partial tax devolution simply means that you shift the balance of deciding uh, how uh, devolved governments are funded from one treasury spreadsheet, which is what you use at the moment to run the Barnett formula, they do run it on an Excel spreadsheet, um, to using two spreadsheets, well, three probably, one, 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 for, one for the Barnett formula side of things, one for the tax side of things, and the third to reconcile them. Um, that would not create very good accountability because all that any devolved government could do would be say, ah, we, well, we did have to put up taxes, but that's because London played with the numbers and they took away our money. And you would simply get higher taxes and blame shifting and some quite acrimonious intergovernmental relations. 
Um, getting Treasury to accept the use of actual numbers was a significant negotiating achievement and significantly enhances how this system might work. When it is implemented, if it's implemented in this form, there will be ab about 30% of Scottish devolved spending will be raised from the, the devolved taxes. That's including also local taxation, council tax, non-domestic rate, which are, at least in principle, already devolved. Um, and there has, for example, been a Scottish choice made over the last few years to freeze council tax. Done that since 2007. Um, so that's a meaningful but still limited degree of own source revenue raising. And it's worth noting that the Scottish Government is responsible for a very significant proportion of public spending in Scotland. It's responsible for about 70% of what's called total identifiable spending in Scotland. Identifiable spending means that spending particularly on defence is excluded because that's for the benefit of the UK as a whole, not one particular part. Um, but that's still a very significant uh, amount of, of spending by a constituent unit. There are a number of big administrative issues within this, and it's one of the reasons why implementation takes quite a long time. A very significant one, one that will start to go live next year, is that simply identifying who Scottish taxpayers are. There's a definition in the Act, um, a set of tests for identifying who a Scottish taxpayer is. It's a test that applies across the whole of a tax year. If you, it, it, the, 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 the test is a closest connection uh, test, and it applies over the whole of a tax year. So the mere fact that you move from Scotland to England or vice versa during a tax year will not in itself alter your, where, you were, where you lived for tax purposes. It won't necessarily alter whether you're a Scottish taxpayer. Um, it will be taken in the round over the course of the entire year. So if you started off the year living in Scotland, living in England, but working in Scotland, and then during the year you kept your job in Scotland but moved to live there as well, it will be very clear that your, connect, your closest connection was in Scotland. If you do it the other way around, your closest connection will be with England, but it will be assessed over the whole of the year. There are some big issues about calculating and adjusting this cut in the block grant. Um, it's worth noting that the Kalman proposals did envisage a needs-based formula at some indefinite date in the future. That got conveniently and quietly shelved. Um, definitely not on the cards as part of this proposals. The Holtham Commission did some sterling work for Wales in how you might, make, how you might consider those, um, those cuts. It's, that does get quite technical, and I won't go into the details about that now. But Holtham... Holtham effectively came up with the answer. Jerry Holtham went to give evidence to the Scottish Parliament. They said, gosh, yes, that's right. That's the best way of doing it. We recommend that. And it got written into the, the plans for implementation of the, uh, of the Scotland Bill. Um, we still, however, haven't had seen any published numbers about the impact of that cut. They're politically pretty explosive, so that's not a wonder, because any numbers would be pretty tentative at this stage. Um, but they, there is a way, a route to a solution, if not an actual solution. The alternative to Calman, has, as I say, has been proposed by the Scottish, by, by the SNP, by the Scottish Government, and that is what is generally called full fiscal responsibility. It can also be called uh, f uh, fiscal autonomy. Um, it would mean that all taxes in or for Scotland would be set by the Scottish Parliament and collected by the Scottish Government. While Scotland remained part of the UK, because this proposal applies to Scotland as a devolved unit within the UK as well as an independent Scotland, there would be a contribution remitted to Westminster to pay for common UK-wide public services. The implication is those would be fairly limited. They would be primarily defence, foreign affairs, international aid, presumably also immigration um, and, and maintenance of the common external boundary. Um, they would not, it would be very hard to see how they could include paying for the welfare state as we understand it at the moment. The implication of this model of full fiscal autonomy is devolution of, the, of welfare benefits pretty much outright. Big complications arise with pensions um, because pensions are 
something that people have accrued as a right because they're UK citizens um, and, they, wherever, and they're entitled to contribute to that and to receive that wherever in the UK they live. So how that would work remains a difficult issue. And the best worked up version of the proposals for full fiscal autonomy, which come from a couple of independent economists, not from the Scottish Government, um, actually said we're going to have to keep some taxes at UK level to pay for, the, for pensions because pensions are such a large amount of money and they're so problematic to deal with. One reason why this proposal has not happened and is quite unlikely to is that the pro-union parties um, essentially do not support it. There is some degree of sympathy for it on the conservative side of politics, um, but it's fairly limited. Um, there is very little support beyond the, beyond the Conservatives that. The Labour and Lib Dems really have very little interest in this at all. The evidence is, um, at least from Scottish social attitudes, that there is support for the levels of taxation being set within Scotland. Um, Scottish social attitudes shows that about 60% of, of the public in Scotland support the idea that the Scottish Parliament sets the level of taxes in Scotland. We can, one, one can argue about what exactly that means. Uh, but that does suggest that, that, there's more, that the public are ahead of the politicians in this respect. Now, if there is a referendum yes vote next September, the outcome is obviously going to be that Scotland will become, in relatively short order, we can question quite how short, an independent state outside the United Kingdom no longer part of any sort of fiscal arrangements with the UK other than those of a sovereign state. Presumably there'll be a, a double tax treaty to avoid double taxation of people's earnings if they live in Scotland and work in England or vice versa. Um, the more difficult questions arise if there's a no vote. Now, all the pro-union parties are at the point of embracing some form of further fiscal devolution. The question is what that means. It's likely to embrace outright devolution of income tax. There seems to be fairly broad support for that. It's been suggested privately by David Cameron. It's been argued for in an, in in a, in an interim report from a Labour Party working group, uh, sorry, Labour Party commission on, on, on devolution. Um, it's been recommended by a Lib Dem uh, Home Rule and Community Rule Commission, as they called it, as well as by a couple of other groups including the thing I've been working on myself, which is a project through the Institute of Public Policy Research called Devo More. So we add Devo More to Devo Max and Devo Plus. Uh, you would, one would probably want to start looking at trying to devolve other taxes. The question is what? All the options start to have quite serious problems. You can't devolve VAT, um, though in many, in many federal countries, sales taxes are used to fund state-level, regional-level government. Um, you, that's because of European Union rules. Corporation tax is profoundly problematic and doesn't raise that much revenue anyway. Um, and at that point, you, the, the only major tax sources left are employers and employees' national insurance contributions. Um, a lot of people often treat national insurance as being one single pot of money, but actually, if you think about it carefully, it's two different taxes. It's a payroll tax paid by employers when they have people on the books. And it's a supplementary income tax paid by employees on their earned income, though of course not on unearned income. Um, and one can try and think about what one might do. If you're serious about fiscal devolution, you, could, you can also argue about some of the smaller taxes. But the smaller taxes are useful as policy levers, perhaps, or not. But they are definitely not major sources of revenue. The biggest of them probably is fuel duties. You will know from Northern Ireland's ex bitter experiences that how, how problematic that can be depending on, how, on prices of fuel and, uh, and the level of duty across the border. Um, the next biggest are alcohol and tobacco duties, and again, they're quite difficult to devolve. Um, not least in a Scottish context because the Treaty of Union says you can't. You've got to be one exercise duty across the whole of the United Kingdom, says the Treaty of Union. Um, so what you do is quite difficult. My solution to this in the context of Devo Moore was to talk about assigning VAT because I think that's the least bad solution to a problem, though it's, it's itself got difficulties. One thing one has to start talking about as well is what happens on the block grant. Now, I've already mentioned how problematic the politics of Barnet are becoming in England. 
and the desirability of trying to find a way of reducing that effect. And I think fiscal devolution helps you deal with that, if only because what it enables is you to say that Scotland has better public services than England, but they're paying more for them. A choice has been made by politicians, it's resulting in a higher level of taxation. It's much harder to object to that than the present source of English resentment, which is the Scots get free long-term care for the elderly, free university tuition fees, free prescriptions, and we're paying for it. Um, because although one can say, well, hang on, there's a policy choice being made here, the fact of the matter is that the Scottish level of, of, of funding through Barnet is sufficiently generous that actually, they're right, the English are paying for it. There is another set of problems that one's going to find with, um, with the approach that's been taken so far to trying to do fiscal devolution, which is this idea of making a proportionate cut um, indexed by some mechanism um, in, the, in the Barnett formula. Because what that's going to do is to start, turn the block grant into something that becomes increasingly notional. And I wonder how far you can have um, the underpinning of, of your finances a system that is ad hoc and administratively odd as Barnett when it's not actually underpinning anything, uh, when it's not because it's, it's lurking there but it's becoming increasingly an abstract idea rather than the definition of the funds that devolved governments have available to them. I think that one wants something a bit cleaner and a bit more logical in order to make it workable as well. We move on to Wales. Debate in Wales began um, again in 2007. Um, Plaid Cymru's entry into government meant that there was a commitment to have a review of devolution finance. That led to the Holtham Commission, which reported in 2010, and said that Wales was underfunded on the basis of its relative need by two or three points. Its relative need, depending on how you calculated it, was somewhere between 115 and 117% of the UK average. It was getting 112% in that year. Um, that amounted to not a huge amount of money, 300 million. Um, significant, but not huge. The real issue was to do with convergence, because it's a property of the arithmetic of the Barnett formula that as spending goes up, because it allocates a, sh a consequential share of changes in spending on comparable functions in England to devolved governments, um, that it will cause over time there to be convergence on the English level of public spending. Now, that would not be a problem if you were, number one, overfunded to start with, as Scotland and Northern Ireland, but not Wales, are at present, or your, your level of funding was, your level of relative need was below that of England. But when England's, uh, services in England are less well-funded than those are in a involved government, um, then you can start to get some quite serious problems. Assume you get the population numbers right, and part of the reason why Scotland is advantaged is because the numbers were wrong for quite a long period of time. Um, th that, that means that you, 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 you have this problem of convergence. Getting the numbers wrong, population numbers wrong appears to be why Scotland did not experience convergence for most of the noughties. Now, Holtham has triggered a debate but not ended it, even though it's a pretty impressive document in technical terms. The Silk Commission, or the Commission on Devolution in Wales, is a UK government commission um, that's effectively the Welsh version of Calman, um, established pursuant to the uh, programme for government that was agreed as part of the coalition deal, published its part one report, which is its report on finance, um, last November. We were promised a, a, a UK government response in, the, response in the spring, and I recall that we were being told privately it was going to be early in the spring. Well, spring came and went, and so did most of the summer, and there was still no response. Um, we still haven't had one. Um, it's been deferred more or less indefinitely, we were told, in June. Um, one would expect it at some point in the autumn. Um, we're told privately, or one learns privately, that what underlies this is a disagreement between, uh, primarily between the Secretary of State and the rest, and that the bones of a deal are in place between the Welsh Government and Treasury. But it's the Secretary of State who is the, 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 the cause of, of, of these delays. Um, we will see what comes. What's quite important, though, about Calman is that its remit was 
limited to financial accountability only. It did not have issues about the fairness of the block grant and fair funding. Those were excluded largely at the behest of the Welsh Government um, as a result of what I would say was a misconceived strategy. Um, they reached a sort of conclusion in October last year, but it's basically an agreement to agree. If, if Wales is going to be unduly disadvantaged by further convergence, then there will be a, an agreement about some further mechanism to increase revenue, to, to, to protect Wales' funds. It's not particularly satisfactory, and it's full of, of ifs and qualifications and, and agreements to agree. The financial proposals of Silk beyond, on, on accountability were very broadly like those of Calman. Devolution of 10 points of income tax, smaller taxes, and a cut in the block grant. The big difference was to avoid what is called the lockstep. Under Calman, the, change, the, the Scottish rate of income tax will have to be the same on all three tax bands. If you, set, if you want to set a 10p rate for the standard rate, you've got to set a 10p rate also for higher and top rates. Silk said, actually, you should be able to set different rates. You should be able to set a 10p rate for the standard rate, but an 11p rate for higher rate, and a 12p rate for the top rate, if you want to. Or a 10p rate, a 9p rate, and an 8p rate, um, which actually would make financial sense, bizarrely. There aren't very many higher rate taxpayers in, in Wales, and you could scare them away quite easily. And that is also a further technical issue where we don't know where the actors stand. Um, if, with the block grant falling below relative need, we do get some really complicated, and, and this agreement from last October to try and result, prevent any further problems arising, we do have some really quite serious issues about whether this system will be so complicated that it will, in fact, stop financial accountability happening. Um, I've written a long and detailed blog post on my blog, Devolution Matters, if people are interested in having a look at that. Let me say something now about Barnet. Now, Barnet, I think, is quite flawed, and it's flawed not just for the reasons that are often advanced, which is that it's, gener it's very generous to Scotland and it's harsh to Wales. That's true, but um, that's not all that's wrong with it. First problem is that it implicitly ties the model of devolved public services to the model that applies within England. Now, that's perfectly justifiable where you have a single political control of a single government with territorially distinct departments. It's not necessarily true when you start to have meaningful political devolution as well. Barnet was designed to allocate funding to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland when they were part of a single UK cabinet. It was designed for forms of direct rule with administrative decentralisation. That's not what we have now. And certainly, Scotland and Wales on the policy spectrum lie to the left of what's going on in England. So the suitability of Barnet with this implicit tie is, I think, quite problematic. We have not noticed this as much as we might have done, because the coalition has protected real-term spending on both health and schools, and those are the largest single elements of devolved public spending. So a decision that was taken very largely for political purposes within England, has had an advantage in protecting devolved budgets as well. There has been a political price to that. I remember having one bank holiday a couple of years ago ruined because the Daily Mail had suddenly noticed the PISA figures, and because it was an August bank holiday and a slow news day, that was their front page headline. And I got called up to, to try and talk about this and explain what was going on. It was all perfectly obvious. There's no, no surprise there at all. If you shelter those two factors, those, those two areas, there are going to be swindling cuts on functions in England that are not devolved in Scotland and Wales. So that's going to cause problems if that, that, that sheltering comes to an end, as it very well might the other side of the next UK election. I've already talked about convergence and the nature of convergence and the problem with that, problems of that. Demography is very important in, in how convergence works. Um, one of the ironies is that um, it punishes you if your population grows. Because obviously the per capita spending is, in, is divided, the same block of money is divided over an increasing number of people. So you lose per capita spending even if, as, as your population numbers go up. That will accelerate convergence. Equally, it will decelerate convergence if your population falls, which was the story for Scotland for very protracted periods of time from the 1970s until about five years ago. 
for you here in Northern Ireland, I would suggest that you also need to start thinking about the question of relative need. What happens if or when the block grant hits the level of relative need? Now, there's been a tendency to assume that Northern Ireland is so far above that level of relative need that it's an immaterial question. It isn't. Holtham's formula, which is a pretty good one, a simple, easily applicable one, um, suggested that the Northern Ireland's level of relative need was 121% 121% of the UK per capita average. My very rough cut calculation um, is that Northern Ireland is presently getting about 127%. So it's six points above its level of relative need, which is quite a nice place to be while you're there. But you cannot assume that you will be there for particularly long, particularly if the sheltering of health and, local gov uh, and, and education spending goes. Um, and especially, ironically, if, something, if, if public spending starts materially to increase. Now, that is admittedly a pretty unlikely prospect, but if it does materialise, don't think it's as good news as it sounds, because that will mean that convergence probably starts to occur. We also come to the issue that, that Detty Mackay mentioned in his, his introduction, the question of what the, of, of the, con the status and nature of this document called the Statement of Funding Policy that determines how devolved governments are funded. It is no more than that. It is a statement of Treasury policy. It is implemented through the numbers that the Treasury then include in the uh, Appropriation Acts each year. So it's, it's legally bind it becomes legally binding through that mechanism, but there is no legal status to that statement at all. It is agreed, it is signed off by UK government ministers, by the UK Secretary of State, not devolved ministers. Um, there's been a call from some of the devolved ministers that they should be the ones to assent to it, and it's hard to disagree with that. Um, because some of the decisions about what goes in and out of the block grant at each particular spending review can be highly contentious. Um, the question of the consequences for the 2012 London Olympics is perhaps the most notable of those, but there's a bunch of other ones. Um, there's been reclassification of spending on things like London, uh, London Transport, or Transport for London as it now is, and Crossrail. Both were originally treated as being spending for the benefit of the UK as a whole. Um, I'm sure that everybody here derives huge benefit from, from, from the existence of the, of, of the London Underground. Um, as a resident of London, I do, but I'm not sure that many of you do. Um, that was reclassified back in the early noughties. Um, and treated as a, a spending for the benefit of England only, which meant that it triggered a consequential. Those sorts of quite technical, obscure decisions have quite significant implications. Adding Crossrail into the, uh, into the list of England-only functions put an extra, roughly an extra billion quid into the Scottish Exchequer, um, which, helped, which has helped quite handily to pay for the cost of the replacement fourth road crossing. Um, and that linkage is, is, was, was quite an intentional one. So these proposals become really quite significant. And I've already talked about this problem of Barnett becoming a notional formula as well. So Barnett is very, very far from being unproblematic. I've already mentioned our Devo More proposals that I'm working on with the Institute of Public Policy Research. This is an attempt to come up with a scheme for enhanced devolution that would work for Wales and Northern Ireland as well as Scotland. It's very easy to look at these things from a Scottish point of view, say, this works for Scotland, um, therefore, therefore it should be on the table, without saying, hang on, if we're talking about something for Scotland, it ought at least potentially be capable of applying for Wales and Northern Ireland as well. It shouldn't be structurally designed not to work for them in the way that full fiscal autonomy doesn't. Full fiscal autonomy could never work for Wales or Northern Ireland. You're both running huge fiscal deficits. They account for, about, for nearly half of public spending in Wales, for about 45% of total public spending in Northern Ireland. Um, Without some system that, guarant that puts transfers into the hands of finance ministers in Wales and Northern Ireland, you, are going, you would face dramatically uh, downscaled public services. Dramatically. Um, and so you, you need to have a system that takes those sorts of factors, the needs of recipient regions uh, as well as, um, as, 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 as ones that are, are pretty close to being in fiscal balance, as Scotland is, um, into account. Um, and to try and come up with a package that dealt with that, I decided that assigning a large chunk of VAT was perhaps the best way to go. Um, 
that would be that would mean that about the, 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 over 55 percent of devolved government spending here what's called DEL spending, the discretionary spending, not social security spending, um, would flow straight into a Northern Ireland finance minister's account. Um, and I think that if you're going to look further than that, employers' national insurance contributions are about the best bet. And as part of this package, you'd also have to start looking at doing a Holtham-style block grant that would fill the space between a reasonable estimate of fiscal capacity and... Um, and what can actually, what's actually needed to pay for public services on effectively the English model. So let me try and conclude by saying some of the things that I think this means for Northern Ireland. First and foremost, this, state, this is not a status quo that we're talking about. The situation may appear to be stable because it's been stable for so long, but it's actually changing and changing pretty fast. There are going to be developments in Scotland, um, whatever the outcome of a referendum. There are, go there are very likely to be some quite significant changes for Wales. There are changes that have already been mentioned for Northern Ireland for funding of local government within England as well. So the idea that the future is going to be like yesterday was is a dangerous and mistaken one. Barnet is not a safe, safe haven in itself because it ties you to a model of English public services that you may well not want, and because the numbers are actually going to start to work against Northern Ireland's interests at some point in the foreseeable future. Not immediately, but, but, but foreseeably so. And its continued existence causes sufficient problems in England that it can't be taken for granted either. And I think that you need to think hard about those issues and what Northern Ireland wants from this sort of a deal um, in order to participate. What Northern Ireland has done, of course, is have the debate about corporation tax. But in this context, I think that was a side issue. It distracted attention from these underlying issues. It assumed that you could use the status quo effectively as an underlying guarantee for public services and that then do some tweaks around the edges with, with, with corporation tax. Corporation tax is an amazingly difficult tax to devolve. It's really much more complicated than, than seems to have figured in the debate here. It has some very, very serious downsides if you get it. Um, and it doesn't do as much as you think it does either. So having it probably wouldn't achieve what you want. So I hope that Northern Ireland will find itself capable of, of, of engaging in these debates in the future, and I look forward to, to discussing these with you now. Thank you. Thank you.